So it's my great honor to um, welcome to the, this second last lecture in the, in the course, Sudarshan Golpaladeshikam. Nearly? Um, or oh, Suds, as we call him, for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, he has, uh, he's worked as, he's maybe going to tell you a little bit about his background, but he worked um, as a data scientist, I think, for Microsoft and was placed inside Benfica for one of his um, missions to help them and ended up, um, well, transferring to work for Benfica doing their data analytics. And he's been very active in the, the Friends of Tracking stuff that we did before this course started. Um, and you'll probably have seen him if you've, if you've seen some of the other videos. And he's going to talk about something that we haven't really taken up that much in the course, and that's how you use fitness data. Uh, and you combine that with, with tracking data. And fitness data is probably even more important in real football clubs than uh, tracking data is currently. Uh, but it tends not to be the focus of what we've looked at in this course. So Suds is going to talk a little bit about how we can integrate and, and put fitness data together with um, tracking data. Um, but with no further ado, I'll hand over to Suds and you should be able to share your screen and everything and um, yeah, have fun and good luck. Awesome. Thank you, David. And thank you to all everyone that's here. Um, it's a big milestone for us to be able to run a course like this, especially because data science is being used more and more within clubs. And uh, in spite of COVID, there's always going to be need for clubs to hire bright uh, young people like you. So thanks for taking the course and it's one step into making sure that there's a data scientist in every a club. I might sound like Bill Gates, maybe, because Bill Gates had that vision of um, Microsoft is going to have a computer inside every home. And I guess my dream would be that every club has a data scientist inside of it. So um, without further ado, I'll get started. Uh, first, before I go into the slides or anything like that, um, I have to confess I'm more of a R programmer, so uh, I'm just going to maybe explain some things. Maybe it's already uh, known for you guys, but I downloaded all of Lori's um, different files that I use that I import into the two files that we're going to go over today, Sports Science Load, Sports Science EPV, and uh, I have them all in one uh, project folder that I call Mathematical Modeling of Football. So. Um, this is just how my setup looks like, my directory looks like in terms of making sure that all the code runs properly and I'm importing the right uh, functions that I need from Lori's code. And a uh, big credit to Lori for helping me with this because um, without this, uh, without all of the code that he's written, it would have taken me much longer to put this lecture together. So um, first, a little bit about myself. Uh, yeah, as David said, I studied mathematics in the US and after studying math, I went directly to Microsoft from undergrad where I was a data scientist and also working on the Power BI tool. So some business intelligence tool at Microsoft. Um, Microsoft had this vision of trying to develop an athlete management system uh, on Azure on their cloud uh, solution so that uh, different teams could then make use of it. Um, and this is because what they learned or what Microsoft learned uh, five, six years ago was that virtually almost every single sporting organization in the world, whether it was uh, football, tennis, basketball, baseball, what, what have you, everyone used Excel. And so Microsoft felt that since they already have everyone within the Microsoft ecosystem, maybe there was something to be done in terms of building an athlete management system. And so when I first got started with this whole thing about almost uh, six years ago, um, the focus was not really around tracking data. It wasn't around tactical analysis. It was more around uh, what we call traditional sports science. And that's because uh, six years ago, 10 years ago, the sort of data that we were collecting um, the volume of the data was more geared towards understanding the physical nature of the game. 
uh, the sort of data that we collected from a tactical perspective, it was still more around the eventing data like Opta, or it was Prozone at the time. And you had data like uh, crosses, shots, passes, things like that. Um, the second thing was that uh, in a lot of the world, England or even outside of England, um, it was a little bit easier to approach the coach with data analysis done on the physical nature of the game. Um, if you tried to approach a coach and tell him that your data was telling him something tactically that he didn't know or she didn't know, um, that was a bit of a trickier situation 10 years ago. This culture is changing uh, on a global scale. More and more coaches are looking to data uh, for being able to improve their decision making or augment their decision making, whether it comes to modifying training sessions or uh, match day strategy. And those are probably things that you've saw in the lectures before this one on how to use tracking data or eventing data to be able to find insights on the tactical side of things. But this all kind of started uh, first with trying to understand the physical aspect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a few slides um, and then to explain what sports science is. And then after that, uh, I will walk through some code. And as always, please write in the chat or please uh, let me know if I'm going too fast or if I'm going too slow or if you guys have any questions. And yeah, let's get started. So sports science, uh, if you think about the history of football, um, football first started with people just coming together, playing a game, virtually no data being used except for just people's eyes. It was just 11 people playing with one another. Great. And then they started to add coaches. Uh, the coach then would be the one that managed the team. And then they would play their games with someone overseeing the preparation of how the team is going to play during game day. Um, and then after coaches, uh, when players got injured, they, ma they mainly went to the local hospital and then got seen by whomever they could uh, get seen by. Um, then they realized, wait, maybe we should have doctors within the team. And so uh, as football progressed, as professional football progressed, you now started to see clubs having their own team doctor. And the natural evolution after having a team doctor was what we call all of these different support staff members, uh, nutritionists, psychologists, uh, and one of them is called a uh, sports scientist. Um, and so this whole natural progression then led to after sports science, now we have data scientists. But in this era of when sports science and sports scientists started getting hired by uh, football clubs, the whole goal was that they wanted someone within the club that could study the human physiology, psychology, anatomy, biomechanics, uh, chemistry, and kinetics to understand how is the human body working during exercise, spe uh, specifically during training sessions, match day, and also gym sessions. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, the teams or the coaches, they want to understand what was each player's uh, load. And so here we define load as the sport and or non-sport burden that's applied to this, uh, as a stimulus to the human body. So load can come in the form of physical load in terms of um, how much distance did they cover, uh, what was their heart rate, um, what were the sort of accelerations they were doing, what was the uh, impact of the, running, uh, of the ground forces on their uh, joints, so even bone load. Um, and it, load could also come in the form of uh, psychological load. So if you are playing uh, in a football match and let's say you are being faced with a 1v2 situation, um, those two opponents that are against you, they might be uh, creating pressure on you. And that sort of pressure might create some sort of uh, anxiety load or some sort of mental stress. And so um, the goal of the sports scientist was to work with all the other people in the club that work around uh, human performance, whether that's physical, psycho psychological, or um, mechan biomechanical, to understand, well, what sort of work are we putting these guys under? And so the two main questions that we measure, uh, or the two main things that we measure are answering the questions, what did a player do? So you can think of this term as called external load and how much did it cost? Um, you can think of this as internal load. Uh, I'm sure if you have a car, I'm sure many of you have a car, um, 
you can think of this as uh, you put gasoline in your car and your car has a certain miles per gallon to it um, based on how efficient of a car it is. It could be fully electric, hybrid, using gasoline, could be using diesel. And depending on the car's uh, efficiency of being able to convert its en energy source into miles or kilometers on the road, uh, we can see that analogy as external load or internal load. So external load would be um, how many kilometers or miles that car actually went, and the internal load would be the cost that the car, it took the car to do it. So the, the internal efficiency of that car being able to convert that uh, energetic source into um, those kilometers or miles. And so what can we do with understanding load? Um, if we can understand how much work or how much stress we are putting these players under, uh, we can then use it to create what we call interventions. And so interventions are effectively methods or programs to ensure that athletes are in an optimal zone of fitness. And so if we are seeing that a player's load is too high, maybe the sort of intervention that we are going to do is we're going to reduce the number of minutes of their um, subsequent training sessions or we might ask that person not to train at all and just focus on recovery. Recovery could be stretching, ice bath, massage, um, and more advanced techniques. And so, um, yeah, that's it. And I think the, the main question, the main uh, thing to think about in interventions are uh, two main factors. So what you see here as number one is we are looking to adjust the number of minutes of exercise as well as the volume or intensity. And so, here we can think of volume being, let's say you went to the gym and you did um, five bicep curls. So your volume there was five because that's what you're doing. Uh, and imagine that you increase that to 10 bicep curls. So you've increased the volume. Um, intensity is more seen as, uh, let's say you were doing five bicep curls using a five kilogram weight and then you changed the kilogram weight to a 10 kilogram weight, but you still stuck with five. So your volume stayed the same, but your intensity increased. And so these are the sort of key terms that sports scientists use to be able to understand uh, what sort of work is the player doing and uh, how do we change it accordingly. So um, I'm going to just do one more slide on external internal load because it's probably the most important concept around sports science before going into anything else. So uh, what you see here is you see a little graph which uh, you have internal, external on the y-axis and you have objective, subjective on the x-axis. And so um, the reason why we have this is because there are different sort of measures that we can create in each quadrant and they each come with their pros and cons. So your internal objective measures, uh, these things are trying to measure the cost it's taking for this human body to be able to perform some sort of work uh, externally onto the pitch. And so most of the internal objective measures are based around blood or heart rate. Um, the benefit of uh, measuring these sorts of things is that they are very good markers in terms of understanding fitness. Uh, but the tough thing about it is that it's fairly difficult to measure this in a scientific way. Uh, meaning, for example, heart rate variability needs to be measured um, every day at the same time, ideally under the same conditions. So five minutes or 10 minutes right after uh, an athlete wakes up, they need to test themselves uh, using an app or using some sort of device to get a true measure of heart rate variability. If we don't have consistency in the measurements, then the sort of data that we're getting back is not that great. Um, at uh, big clubs or at a club like Benfica or uh, Real Madrid or Barcelona or things like that. It's a little bit more difficult to be able to measure things with more consistency um, just because of all the things that an athlete has to do and we're asking this athlete to do one extra thing. Um, so maybe within college teams or even within uh, second division teams in Portugal or something like that, we could maybe implement heart rate variability, but for a club like Benfica, it's quite tough. Um, but we do understand the benefit of being able to use something like this. 
Uh, so on the other side, on the more subjective side, uh, what we see is it's not necessarily we're using an IoT type device to measure something, but we are just asking the athlete or the coach um, how they felt about the training session. So typically what happens uh, every day is when the athletes uh, report to the facility before the first training session, um, they'll have to answer this wellness survey. And this wellness survey is uh, simply maybe a four or five question questionnaire, which is asking on a scale of one to 10 or one to seven, uh, how well did you sleep? Um, how is your uh, muscle soreness? Um, how energetic do you feel today? Uh, what is your mood from a scale of one to seven? Some things like that. And so these are more subjective in nature. Uh, they are really good indicators of understanding where a player is at. Um, they're reliable and easy to implement, and they are telling um, markers of understanding someone's fitness. But the cost of it is that it requires educating the athlete in terms of being able to answer consistently. Uh, that takes time, and it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do. So while there is many studies and many, a lot of research out there that shows that these sort of subjective questionnaires are really good, um, the actual practical implementation at a club uh, is not so easy. Um, and yeah, so then those are the more internal markers. Your external markers are then measuring what the player actually did, what you can visibly see uh, if you ever watch a game or if you watch a training session. And that is your standard devices, such as the GPS monitor that the players wear, that sports bra that they wear, um, which contains an accelerometer, gyroscope, manometer, and things like that. Uh, and then you also have other measures such as um, squat jumps, uh, one-legged jumps, uh, things like that, which you can do and test people outside of the field uh, before training sessions to get an objective measure of their power output or their strength. Um, the whole issue with uh, these objective measures are that they are invasive. And so one of the nice things about using tracking data is that we are slowly moving away from uh, making players wear something, but we're actually moving away towards where they don't necessarily need to wear something, which might be good. Um, so yeah, hopefully uh, this gives you a better understanding of what internal and external load means. Um, if you have any questions around this, please don't hesitate to ask because it's probably the most important concept within sports science. So these are just the different sort of devices uh, that the players will wear throughout the day. And this is what I, I mean about invasive is we are asking them to do a lot. Um, is in the upper left, you see what the GPS device actually looks like um, and the sort of sensors that it may have. And um, here in the bottom picture is you see the little uh, bra or the vest that they use that secures that device somewhere here uh, between their shoulder blades so that we can get readings about their uh, external load measures. Um, what you see here, uh, the women on the treadmill, is a sort of test that a lot of clubs use before um, the regular season starts, usually during preseason, to measure what we call a VO2 max. Um, it is uh, trying to understand what is the oxygen uptake uh, value uh, for an athlete when they are performing work at high velocities or at sustained velocity. Uh, it lets us uh, have an idea of what their maximal out power output could be. Um, here on the right uh, gives us uh, blood lactate testing. So um, this gives us an understanding of how much lactate is within the blood after doing some sort of strenuous activity. But it does require us to take a prick of, um, take a prick of the ear to be able to obtain a blood sample. Um, and that is, again, very invasive. Uh, the lower, the, this right thing is just a heart rate monitor that attaches to the GPS. And then one thing that a lot of clubs use are something that we call force plates. Uh, force plates, they measure the amount of force that's being uh, exerted upon them. And uh, we usually use this for doing different sort of jump tests. So asking players to do uh, jumping repeatedly or with two legs, jumping repeatedly with one leg. And what we can see is you can see a curve over time to understand how much force are they able to exert on the plate as time passes. Uh, and it gives us an understanding of how um, 
fatigued a player might be. Or if we do this before the regular season, it gives us an understanding of how much uh, strength this player has to begin with. So these are the sorts of devices that um, we use on a day-to-day -day basis or week-to-week -week basis. So it's um, one question which is maybe yeah. partly answered by this thing. Mark wonders what you do with incoming players. So um, if you don't, you on the previous slide, you're, if you've signed a player or if you're deciding to sign a player, you don't have much of that data that's there. Um, what do you do uh, there, or, or and are the data clauses where where the where you get their data transferred from another club? That's an interesting idea. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So most of the times uh, we won't know the sort of physical data, and this is maybe what um, broadcast tracking can help us with. But most of the times when we're doing scouting on players, we don't necessarily know their physical uh, capabilities. Um, we will only know when we do a actual deal with them. And when we talk to the club, the club, the club that we are buying from will typically then send us some sort of profile or report on the athlete. So when a new player comes, uh, we need to start from scratch and typically wait around 10 to 15 sessions before establishing any sort of baselines for this athlete. Um, but there's no regulation that they have to keep a certain data file because I mean you're buying players for like 50 million euros or something and there's no regulation that says they have to keep on record their physical the, not not the player him or herself uh, through GDPR of course the player has uh, full ownership of their data but okay. the player is not handing over some sort of USB drive or <laughs> so dossier giving us their physical metrics um, and uh, we need to rely upon the club that we're buying from to be able to provide us uh, the last test. I know for a fact that when we sell a player to another club we provide them uh, a PDF or a PowerPoint around all the different sort of tests that we've performed for that athlete and uh, give that to the team that we just sold it to so that they have more or less an understanding of that player's physical um, capabilities. Mm -hmm. but the scouting process, we don't know anything yet. Maybe, uh, maybe broadcast tracking can help us with this. This is definitely something that uh, the industry should explore as a whole. Mm -hmm. And secondly, there's no real regulation uh, around this. So typically, we need to wait around 10 to 15 sessions before we establish some sort of baseline and understand where that player is at. Yeah. Um, and Vinny asks, is there any reasons that they don't wear um, specific reasons why the sensors are not permissible to be worn during matches? It's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, in the Portuguese league, uh, we can. Uh, I think it's now become a league by league basis on the decision that they make. Um, so in the Portuguese league, we can wear um, GPS and heart rate during training and match. So for us, it's no problem. Um, I'm not necessarily aware of the reason why other leagues uh, wouldn't allow that. Um, a lot of players don't like to wear them. That's very yeah, that's true. But I don't think the league is. I don't think the league is making that decision based on the fact that the players don't like to wear no, them. No, but but uh, that but one. I think that that's the more because I think they are allowed in most leagues now. But then the the next challenge is that the players won't put them on. Yeah. Um, or and they think you know oh this weighs 150 grams. It's going to slow me down or something like that. Well, so that's a, that's a good, uh, that's one maybe thing I didn't mention here is that around the subjective internal responses, so the session of RPE, if you ask someone their rate of perceived exertion, if you ask a, an athlete, oh, how hard did you think today's training session was? Um, it's very hard to get an athlete to say that the training session was hard, an eight, nine, or a 10. Yeah. Um, people immediately think, oh, they're going to measure uh, what I thought of that training session. They're going to think an eight, nine, ten meant I was not capable of actually doing this training session, and the coach might not pick me for the next game. Um, that's very common thinking uh, that athletes have when it comes to any sort of measurements that we take on them. So, whether it's a subjective sort of question that we ask them or a GPS device, um, I agree with you, David. Uh, a lot of these athletes they are a bit skeptical about how this data is actually being used and. Uh, if if it might actually be used uh, not to their benefit. 
Um, yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen like players, for example, when they say, how do you feel? They'll just put in a 10 every day. Then yeah. we do the match and they put in zero. And that's their answers, you know, because that's that's what they that's what they hope. That's what they think you want them to say. You know, I feel like then I feel great, great, great. We lost shit. Yeah, no, and, and that's the thing is um, it's taken almost a decade, more than a decade for clubs and athletes to kind of have trust with sports science. Mm. And this is really to show them time after time that we're trying to use this data for their own benefit and not to try to use it against them. Um, and the funny thing is, is that they think that these sorts of numbers might be used against them. But um, at the end of the day, most of this work does not necessarily go to the head coach. It goes to the physical fitness coach and the physical fitness coach provides suggestions to the head coach. And it's ultimately the head coach's main decision. So are a very important player uh, regardless of your fitness state you're probably still going to play because he needs you for tactical reasons mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the skepticism is is warranted but uh, the real the realistic aspect is that um, just because we are using this data to understand if a player is tending towards fitness or if the ten if they're tending towards fatigue it's still the decision of the head coach to know how to use this information so the athletes don't need to be that worried, I don't think. But that's my opinion. Great. Um, I think we've answered most of the questions there. There's one question about how has data scientists help a sports scientist, but I think you're going to come to that. So I'll, I'll yeah. let you get on. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. I'm not going to move through this. I'm not a sports scientist by education, so I won't be able to explain this slide completely. Uh, but effectively, um, sports scientists focus on two different aspects, the physiological aspect, which is the chemical and physical nature of how the cells and um, organisms are actually working together to, to be able to produce work. And then the biomechanical aspect, which is the mechanical um, nature of how these organisms move uh, to be able to produce work. And so um, the main image is to see uh, here this uh, spectrum of underload homeostasis overload failure. Um, and this is exactly where we are trying to define what load means and then how to use load to understand if we are actually uh, moving a player towards uh, one of these four categories. And so in homeostasis, we are we're not necessarily improving that player's fitness. We're just maintaining whatever level they have. In overload, uh, it's good. We are stressing the muscle or we're stressing the body just enough so that uh, it's becoming more efficient in its processes of being able to use oxygen and internal energy stores. Uh, and if we're giving that player too much to do, then the body will just uh, experience a complete meltdown and that's where injuries uh, happen. Um, underload is the exact opposite, is we're not giving this player enough work. And again, this is where injuries happen. Uh, underloading is a very common theme that you might see around players who are um, on the fringe of the team. So um, what is generally the heuristic is that match day is the best sort of exercise or the best training session for an athlete. It gives them all of the sort of different types of load that they need, running in straight distance, running in high velocity, running in low velocity, changes of direction, uh, all of these different things. Um, but the players that don't play that much, um, who, don't, uh, who are not even used as regular substitutes, uh, we need to be careful in making sure that we're providing them uh, enough uh, high level uh, work that kind of simulates a match because uh, let's say that one of our main strikers gets injured and then his immediate backup also gets injured. And now we have a player that needs to fill in uh, for the striker position, but he's someone that doesn't really play too many games um, and he just does training sessions. Uh, this could be seen as underload because we're not necessarily giving this player uh, enough work to do. Um, we're not giving him a match day stimulus. And so when they do play for the match, this person might actually be at risk of uh, injury because we've not been giving them sufficient amounts of load. And so to answer this question of how do we actually measure if someone is uh, moving towards fitness or not, uh, this sort of is a very simple concept that I think explains this idea perfectly. So. This was something called a training efficiency index. It was proposed by a researcher by the last name Delaney. Um, and what he said was, if you create a log linear relationship 
between whatever your external training load metric is, whether that's total distance or whether that's distance covered at high velocities or things like that. And you um, relate that to your internal training load metric, um, which could be, let's say, average heart rates, uh, could be session RPE, could be that subjective measure that you use, um, something like that. Uh, then you could create um, a coefficient to understand uh, where is this player tending towards and then measure what today's uh, training session is relative to that line of best fit. And so here, what you see here in the lower right is uh, you see that this is someone's training sessions for about uh, 40 days or something like 30 days or something like this. And we can see that this person is tending towards a higher efficiency, uh, efficiency meaning that it's requiring less internal load to be able to produce the same or if not more amount of external load. So um, maybe after 10 weeks, uh, my heart rate has been able to stay below 170, but I'm able to still run 10 kilometers or I'm, still, or I'm able to do more than 10 kilometers while my heart rate is still below a certain level. Um, so here we see that someone is tending towards fitness and then we can understand at each individual level using the standard errors um, if we are actually underloading, overloading homeostasis or going to complete failure. So this is a very simple regression. It's just a linear model using the um, log values of your internal load and external load metrics. But it's a very simple way for us to understand uh, was today's training session easy, medium, hard, and where is this player tending towards? Is he tending upwards, becoming more efficient, or is he tending downwards, um, becoming more fatigued? Uh, I believe there was a question that popped up, but I will move forward until David stops me. Um, so uh, what we then use is something called training periodization. You can think of an entire season as broken into different sort of categories. So one whole season can be seen as the macro cycle. Uh, one macro cycle is made up of different mesocycles. Um, one mesocycle is made up of different micro cycles and a micro cycle is typically a week, um, Sunday to Sunday, match day to match day. And between match day to match day, you have all of your different individual sessions. And so um, what sports scientists typically do is uh, create uh, these sorts of uh, graphs to measure the periodization. So here we have a sort of graph that's created as a okay, match day plus one, day off, and then we have a lot of work four days before the match, before the next match, three days before the next match, before it tapers off. Um, and so this sort of uh, training periodization is then what you see similar to here. So we have some up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, uh, like this. Um, and so this is more or less the concept of training periodization. Here, uh, what we can do is we can use uh, different regression techniques um, to be able to measure what was the uh, match day minus four, match day minus three, match day minus two, match day minus one values, and how did that actually relate to the match day output. And so what this allows us to do is allows us to create a relationship between how the sports scientist thinks the athlete should train during the week and their match day output. What this uh, gives us, it gives us a sort of predictive model that allows us to uh, try to get a better understanding of if a player trains like this during the week, he's going to perform um, this amount of total distance or this amount of high speed running and things like that. Now, uh, we know that uh, for each match that we play, uh, the opponent is going to make a huge difference in terms of um, what the player is going to be able to do. Uh, but for more or, for more, uh, or less, uh, we, can get a better we can get a good understanding of what is the player capable of doing, not necessarily what they actually need to do, because that requires different tactical demands based on the opponent that they play. But we can get a sense of what they're capable of doing. And so what this then lets us uh, do is lets us create um, training drill optimizers. I'm just going to play a video. But this uh, training drill optimizer is using a regressive technique in the background, um, sort of decision tree, to be able to understand uh, based on the number of minutes for each training session, 
um, for each training drill within a training session, what is the external load going to be for each player uh, in the team? And uh, how does that actually relate to what their potential match day output is? So I'm just gonna play this. This is written in R, not in Python. Um, but it gives you a sense of kind of completing the cycle of using data science to then help the sports scientists a little bit better. So here we're selecting just a, a drill. Um, here it's, it's in Portuguese, but it means uh, Warm up. This is just a simple warm up drill happening at the moment. And we can predict what the external load for this drill is going to be um, and uh, combine this with other drills that are happening as well. So this one is uh, building out uh, from the midfield line, to trying to enter into the opponent half. Uh, and then we can see again how does this actually change for each of the different athletes. And here we're just playing a 6v6 or 8v8 game to end the training session uh, using half the pitch. And we see, okay, uh, at the end, um, we are failing these two players. We are giving overload to these players and we're creating homeostasis for these players. And so this is more or less how, um, from a high level view, how data science is used to try to help the sports scientists within a club. Any questions before we move forward? No? Okay, sorry, I'll check the chat. Okay, uh, just very quickly, the load metrics in that Excel file, I think they were using total distance and then the internal load metric was something called trim. Um, I'm not going to be the best person to explain what trim is, uh, so I'm going to write it in the chat and you can take a Google of it. Uh, it's effectively uh, a measure of understanding um, how much uh, cost was it from a heart rate perspective to the athletes, um, but I'm not, I'm, not the best I'm not the best person to explain what it means, but this was the me measure that they used. Uh, if you take a Google of it, you'd be able to read a little bit more about it. Um, yeah, okay, great. So the whole goal uh, of this lecture and this course is we want to try to move to a more non-invasive method um, to make uh, sure- Sorry, 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 I missed. <laughs> sorry, Sadza, I had to, um, can, can I just check where, where are we in the, because we're five minutes now from break time, is this, is this uh, wrapping up this session or is it the start of a next part, do you think? It's the start of the next part. I was going to now go into the coding part. Okay. Um, do you want to do this slide first and then have the five minute break? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Oh, this slide is very simple. All of this, is, um, this is, yeah, for us is to be able to move away from uh, using uh, devices uh, like the GPS device or heart rate monitors and things like that and trying to move into something a little bit more non-invasive. And so this is the benefit of the tracking data that we can get. Uh, now, tracking data does have limitations, which I'll show after the break, but uh, it gives us a good understanding of being able to get physical metrics from these players without asking them to wear a GPS monitor. So with the data that you have in these challenges using the skill corner data, um, you'll be able to see that uh, we'll be able to actually get physical data from these players, even if they're not uh, a player from our team, which can greatly help with scouting. Um, but that's it. Uh, the second half of this will be going through a bunch of code, going through different algorithms that we use in sports science. And that's it. I will then, then the good thing is then I have, time, I have time for my question then, because I, I was interested in the previous slide. I mean, one thing I've been emphasizing a lot on the course, we've been doing a lot of linear regressions, logistic regressions, and so on. And um, there's a lot of error in these things. So in the presentation you did, you just showed, you show, showed like, you know, here is where we were for those players in that session. Oh yeah. What is the error in those types of predictions from your model, the model fitting error? How big is that? Yeah, um, so for us, it's actually fairly good. Uh, we've been using GPS devices for about three years. Mm. 
have a consistency in the way that we name our uh, name our drills and things like that. Um, name our drills and also provide metadata around our drills, such as the dimensions and the number of minutes. Mm. And, uh, I'm not doing anything fancy. I'm just using a linear mix model, um, having my players as my random effect. And I'll do an example of a linear mix model in the second half of the slides. Um, but the error uh, reduces significantly after having three seasons worth of data. Uh, again, I, don't, I wouldn't use something like this with only half a season's worth. Um, the sort of results that you get compared to what actually happens on the pitch is too great. It's beyond uh, standard deviation or even two standard deviations. Um, so these sorts of, these sorts of drill calculators, uh, I don't see the value in them if you don't actually have uh, enough years to go off of. Mm. And again, you're limited because here you only have your own club's data. Is there anything in the literature which allows you to work out what a sort of, what you might have a, as a prior model for these types of things? That's a good question. I don't know. I've not read, I've not seen too many research papers on actually drill calculators per se. Um, it's not necessarily a topic that's uh, published about too frequently. So um, this I don't know the answer to. And every club, I mean, you've developed this drill calculator yourself. Yeah. Um, how standard do you think this is in other clubs that they, that they have this? Uh, the clubs that I know and speak to, I know that they have something like this, mm -hmm. um, but I can only speak to that. I don't think it's uh, used um, by many clubs. I think most sports scientists, what they will do is they will have uh, in Excel files or uh, their own analyses saying, okay, typically when we do this sort of drill with this many minutes, um, it's generally around this much load. Uh, but uh, that's really about it. Um, I know before data was used, a lot of sports scientists just said, okay, uh, we're doing this drill with these dimensions for these many minutes. Um, it's going to be maybe a yellow. And then the next drill will be with these dimensions in these number of minutes, and it's going to be a red. Uh, <laughs> how they did it before they used data, but I don't know. I know, for example, PSG has a calculator like this. Um, and uh, Aspire Academy as well um, has a calculator like this. But aside from that, I'm not sure who all is using this. I'm sure in the EPL, many clubs are using something like this. Uh, there's a question about if there's commercial drill calculators available. None that I know of. Okay. None, none that I know of that actually make use of mixed modeling. Um, I think most of them are maybe using linear models, but those violate uh, independence, the assumption of independence, because mm. here we're doing repeated measures. And so none that I know of that actually use the right assumptions. But if you do know of a solution, please send it my way. Yeah, I think there probably isn't because every club has, because it relies on such uh, sensitive data as well. Um, I mean, I, I do. I actually do know some commercial solutions, but I don't know any that are any good. So I'm not going to do an advert for them. Yeah, I think I think that's the. I think the, I think the trick is that the club needs to have, um, as of any data science project, the club needs to have a good uh, collection process of the metadata or the mm -hmm. sort of categorical data that we're going to feed a model. And so here we need to have um, a unified training methodology in terms of. If you see here on the left, we have the drill category and the different drills. Yeah. Uh, have a unified training methodology to make sure that the drill names are the same, the drill categories are the same, and everyone is bought into the same methodology. And so yeah, because that, that's got to be a problem because when your new coach comes in, um, he will introduce 10 new drills, won't he? Or uh, that will be right. So we, we need to make sure, yeah, we need to make sure that it actually fits within. Uh, the Benfica methodology that we playing. Okay. Um, so it's it's a good problem. Uh, here, this example is showing uh, youth academy data, which our technical director has unified across all the different youth teams that we have. All right. So yeah. But yeah, it's it's definitely uh, 
something that we need to take into account whenever we do have a new coach and they bring in their own ideas and their, uh, their own drills that they want to do. Yeah. Cool, great. Okay, we'll have a break now and we'll be back at 11.15. See you awesome. then.